No. At the Rutland Heart Center, we'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your week and your evening to come join us. We're really excited. We, it's a good thing to have to bring more chairs in. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we're really excited to begin the first of our community presentations that we're doing here at the Rutland Heart Center. Um, we had uh, became part of a the Rutland Regional Medical Center back in 2011. Actually, our one year in, or two year anniversary is next Monday, April 1st of 2011. And back in September of 2011, we joined um, all five of the cardiologists in Rutland under the same practice. So, in addition to Dr. Bonazinga, who's going to be speaking tonight, we have Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Robotello, Dr. Higgins, and Dr. Fitz. One of the great things that we have in this community that a lot of communities don't is that we have five cardiologists who all practice together. They share patients, they share information, and you have kind of one-stop shopping here. So in addition to being able to see a cardiologist when you're here visiting, we also have a testing center, and that is actually downstairs where we do echoes and nuclear tests and stress testing. So we're able to not only provide most of the services here, but we also have a partnership with Rutland Regional Medical Center, so those things that we can't do here, we can either refer to the hospital, or we also have partnerships with Fletcher Allen and Dartmouth Hitchcock, and some of those doctors come here to see our shared patients. So it's really kind of a great opportunity for us to have all these great cardiology services here in Rutland, under one roof, where everybody works together. Um, personally, I'm incredibly proud to say that I work with the cardiologist and also with some of the best staff you will ever find. So if you haven't been a patient here, um, I will tell you that we have the best front office staff, nursing staff, testing center staff. They treat everybody as they want to be treated and I'm incredibly proud to work with each of them. They certainly behave in the same way that our cardiologists do and all of them treat our patients as, as if they want to, as the way they want to be treated themselves. So we're really excited to have you here tonight. Um, before I uh, go on, I just there's a couple things, and we're still moving some chairs in, so I apologize. It might be a little bit noisy back there. Um, but we have also Tim Philbin here with us tonight. So Dr. Bonazinga and Tim Philbin, Til, Tim Philbin from WSYB. So one of the things that Dr. Bonazinga does, in, in addition to practicing cardiology, is that he has a radio show on WSYB every other week on Tuesday mornings um, with Tim that's called Bart the Heart. Has anyone ever heard Bart the Heart talk? There you go. If you have it, you want to tune in. We can get you the information. It's very entertaining. Most of the time, it's about medical issues. So occasionally, sometimes, I think they do veer off into some other things. Hunting. 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 Well, hunting, <laughs> yes, which is very important when you're talking about cardiology health. Um, but Tim joined us as well tonight. So we're going to have this almost like a town meeting kind of open um, discussion. They're going to, Dr. Bonazinga is going to talk about irregular heartbeats. And Tim is also going to talk to him and maybe <coughs> ask some questions. It's really, really important to each of us. Um, that if you have some questions that you feel comfortable raising your hand, asking questions. When we're done with the formal presentation, um, we do have some refreshments downstairs and we're happy to take people on tours of our testing facilities as well. We know a lot of people the first time you come in to see a cardiologist or maybe the first time you're having cardiology issues, it's very, very nerve-wracking to know that you've got to go have an echo or you've got to go have a stress test. Those are all things that we throw around, um, you know, like potatoes and potatoes, but the bottom line is it is stressful for people. So we'd like to kind of introduce you to our facility and have a chance to answer some of your questions. If we don't have the answers for your questions today, and I actually have a lot of my Heart Center staff here, we'll take your name and take the question and we'll get back to you in the next few days. Um, Dr. Montezinga joined the um, staff at Rutland Regional Medical Center back in 1981. As I said, he became part of the Rutland Heart Center back in 2011, along with the other four cardiologists. And uh, we're very happy to have him speaking tonight on irregular heartbeats. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Bonazinga and Tim Philbin. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Dr. Bonazinga, or Dr. Bart the Heart, which was coined by Tim Philbin. thought that was pretty neat. Didn't have a lot of uh, nicknames, but that's a good one. Um, one of the things we do on the radio show is we go back and forth as, as though Tim was the patient or Tim has a question about it. But we want audience participation here. There will be no testing. We'll keep no records except for that. And nobody will see your face. Um, <coughs> What we wanted to do is, in these series of, of lectures or town hall meetings here at the Rutland Heart Center is discuss problems that we, we all have or that are very common. Um, basically, today we're talking about irregular heartbeats, which is kind of a, almost a cardiology term, but in my opinion, for most of us patients out here, 
uh, and we're all patients at one time or another, we talk about palpitations. Mm -hmm. Now palpitations mean a different thing to everybody. So uh, has anybody in this room ever had a palpitation? You think you have. Very good. What I'd like to do is have people um, raise their hand, ask questions, talk about it as we go along. I might even call on somebody to, to discuss or to say what their symptom or whatever they had was, if you don't mind. If anybody doesn't want to talk to me, they can go, no. But uh, it, what I'd like to do is to make it as informative as possible and make sure we get your questions answered while we talk about a certain subject. Now, um, just to start with, we've got to do at least what we're dealing with. This is a heart. Okay, and it's got four chambers, and most people know that, and the heart has an electrical system, so we're dealing mostly with the electrical system today. Everybody's heartbeat starts up in the corner here, in the right atrium, and every part of this heart is electrical. If you take this heart, or if you take a heart out of a frog, as they used to do in biology classes, and cut it up into little tiny pieces, every single piece will beat. It has its own intrinsic electrical rhythm. And that's a really good thing, because if one part of the heart dies, then the other part takes over. But it also means that parts of the heart are always arguing with each other. Who's in charge? Usually the pacemaker, that green star up here, is the pacemaker. And that's supposed to be the nice, even, relaxed rhythm that we're all supposed to have. So this fires, little electrical blip that you see on a cardiogram or on an electrical signal. And it goes down to the middle section here. This is the middle section or AV node, but middle section. And then it goes down to the big pumping chambers down here and tells them all to beat. And that's your basic electrical system. And if you look inside a heart, they actually are a little bit different colored tissues that you can actually see. They look like little yellow wires. And some people you can't see them on, but we're actually not looking inside. So a normal rhythm is start here, go to the middle, and then down the two sides. So this is the top of the heart, the middle of the heart, and the bottom of the heart, which we will refer to. So we're talking about palpitations today. Um, who's had a palpitation? Okay, you've had a palpitation. Sure, pretty girl the other day, my heart skipped a beat, not the same. <laughs> not quite the same. Uh, so, so we want to know, what about this palpitation? Is he just a lech, or is he really a nice guy? So, I mean, how many of these do you have? You have them every time you walk down the street? Is he a pretty girl? What's the difference between that? Now, what is, when I say I have a palpitation, what should I feel? So there's all kinds of different palpitations. They mean something different to everybody out here. A palpitation can be a thump, a bump, a skip, a pause, a racing, or a flutter. Has anybody ever had a flutter? Like where their heart goes like that? It's the first question we always ask people. Part of the cardiac history is the first thing we want to know about when we have someone come in with a palpitation. If I don't hear from at least three or four patients a week with new palpitations, it's a surprise. Gradually go down. Sometimes it's just like that. And, it, and what happens when it stops? Just stops. Do you ever get it when you're running up a hill, when there's no Some, girls yeah. around? As a matter of fact, the other day I was outside working and I walked up the hill and it was like I had run 500 miles. And then and, and okay, the heart was racing. So you got to the top of the hill, and now you said, I better mm -hmm. cool it for a little while and rest. So what happened to your heartbeat? What did it, it slowed do? down. It Slowly. just went back to normal. Went back to normal. So everybody knows what their normal heartbeat is. We all feel when we're in sync. You don't like to feel out of sync. And everybody's different. Now, the other thing that's important is sometimes you feel out of sync from something in your chest. It may not even be the heart. But that's our job. We want to find out if a palpitation mm -hmm. is normal, is a funny heartbeat, a lot of funny heartbeats, racing heartbeats, or is it slowing heartbeats where it's just strong? Some people call a palpitation a pounding heartbeat. But that's slow though, that's about the right speed, about 60 or 70 beats a minute. But what happens if it's coming from a different part of the heart? So we're going to talk about that in a second. Now, um, has anybody here had uh, what they call flutter, a uh, fibrillation? Okay, fibrillation is the other end of the spectrum. So from the top of the heart, Tim here has a racing heartbeat when a girl goes by. He gets a fast heartbeat when he goes up a hill. Those are both very normal reactions to your, of your heart to an increase in exertion or stress or adrenaline or blood pressure. Those are normal. If, it's, if it starts suddenly, right out of the blue, and stops suddenly, we tend to think that might be a racing heartbeat. The most common type of palpitation that people get are skips. And that's where you suddenly feel a thump or you feel a pause. Now, a lot of skips are actually not feeling the extra heartbeat. You get an early beat of electricity from here or up in this area, 
And then the, this next beat that comes down is late. And because it's late, it's stronger. So people say, I feel my heart skips and then thumps hard. Now most of those are normal. And they can come from the top of the heart, the middle of the heart, and the bottom of the heart. Single heartbeats are usually not serious. But then again, what are you really feeling? You've got to find out. Now, suppose um, you are running up the hill, and you have your extra heartbeat, and it's racing. Okay, so then you sit down, and you cool off, and you have a nice, you know, take, drink some water, and it keeps going, and going, and going. Would you, would you think that was normal? I'd be calling you. Okay, so, so he, someone calls me up on the phone and says, I started out going up a hill, my heart was racing, and now it won't stop. So then we want to know from you patients, this fast heartbeat, can come from the top, the middle, or the bottom. It's still going, and it should have gone down by now. You know when your heartbeat is slowed down appropriately, right? I mean, this is a certain amount of time. I know when I'm in shape, I can go further. I know when I'm out of shape, it lasts longer. But what if it just won't go away and it's racing? Those set off more bells and whistles for us, make us more concerned. So when someone has a fast heartbeat that doesn't stop, they tend to call the doctors. Now, how else can you feel with that? Well, you can be dizzy, you can feel warm, you can feel lightheaded, some people get chest pains. These are all related symptoms that we're going to ask you when someone has this kind of rhythm. So, so the first type of heartbeat that we doctors really want to know about, besides, besides just skips, is when they're racing and they don't stop. Because that can be any kind of an important heartbeat or a dangerous heartbeat from the top of the heart, the middle of the heart, or the bottom of the heart. Racing from the top of the heart can be that atrial fibrillation thing. That's probably the most serious because some people with atrial fibrillations will have the atrial fibrillation racing heartbeat and result in strokes. We gotta know about that. So we're gonna ask you histories and we're gonna wanna evaluate it. Now, what about racing heartbeats from the middle of the heart? Very unusual. Racing heartbeats from the bottom of the heart are much more serious and they are, so, they are associated usually with some sort of heart disease. So that's the racing heartbeat type question that we're going to be answering and evaluating. Now, um, are there types of heartbeats that would um, be totally benign that are racing? Well, they're usually associated with other conditions, high thyroids, um, dehydration, sunstroke, they can all set off that kind of rhythm. So once we've talked to the patient about their rhythm, someone calls me up and says they're having a racing heartbeat, we need to evaluate it right then. What if you had a racing heartbeat two weeks ago? How are we going to find out what that's like? Um, most people, if it goes away, they're not calling the doctors, right? They're going to wait and see what happens again. Well, what are associated dangerous symptoms with a fast heartbeat? Dizziness, always important. Doesn't stop, always important. Passing out, serious. That's where you want to go to the hospital. Anything that makes you pass out is usually serious. And we want to catch you in the middle of it. So once we've got the, um, the situation with the um, uh, fast heartbeat, we're going to want to evaluate that. So, so you come to me and say to me, I'm having racing heartbeats on and off, or I would ask you, when does this happen? How long does it last for? Um, and then I'd want to know associated symptoms. So if you had a fast heartbeat, what else would worry you with that? Uh, I'd be getting into like a cold sweat. Sometimes if, I, if, if I'm outside exercising, and it's, it's actually a cool day like this, and I'm not working real hard, and suddenly I get into this cold sweat, I'd be really concerned that something was wrong. And, and my problem here though is, when do I know to call a doctor and when should I just sit back and say, Mother Nature will just take care of what's going on and everything will calm down? At what point do I say, I have a real emergency here? Well, when people have racing heartbeats, uh, we're usually concerned, but many patients call us later. So we're going to ask them, how long did it last for? Where did you feel it? Well, I felt it way down here in my stomach or I felt it up my throat. Very common that fast heartbeats that are important you feel up in your throat. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna want to know when you had it how long it lasted for, and what are other associated symptoms with it. You said you had sweating. So now I'm going to do a directed interview. I'm going to ask him, well, did you get any chest pain with that? No, just my heart felt like it was going to come out of my chest. And you didn't have chest pain first, bringing no. it on, because no. chicken and the egg is always important in medicine. Which came first? And what did you do to get rid of it? I just sort of sat down for a minute, calmed down, just relaxed. Didn't take any medicine? Didn't take any medicine. Were you sick at the time? Did you have a cold? Did you take any cold medicines? Nope. Did you have 16 cups of coffee? <laughs> Which everybody knows, coffee's okay, one or two, but you, you have 16 of them, you can have a racing heartbeat just from the coffee. So your spell went, did it go away? It did, but I, I felt odd from it. I, I felt very tired afterwards. 
-hmm. Now, that raises an extremely important point. If, if I'm a patient, and I have been, and Tim's a patient, and you are worried about it, if you think it should be checked, if you have a palpitation, which everyone in this room has had probably, and every medical person has had, if you think to yourself, maybe I should get it checked, you probably should. If you think to yourself, I'm fine, this was nothing, I ran up the hill right after that and I felt great, I'm going to blow that off. That's probably okay, but maybe not for racings. But if you think you should have it checked, then you should. Suppose somebody, I, I know that I have friends that have heart murmurs, and they tell me, oh, I have this heart murmur and I feel this palpitation. That heart murmur is acting up. Tell me the difference between a heart murmur and what we're talking about now. Are they related at all? They can be, but actually some people think heart murmurs and palpitations are the same things. Heart murmur is a sound that I hear with this thing. That's the definition of a heart murmur. Now, the heart has regular sounds, lub-dub. Now, in between the lubs and the dubs can be buzzing noises. They can be normal, they can indicate bad valves in the heart, thick muscles, other conditions, or they can be totally innocent. That's a murmur. So many patients, and remember we said palpitations can be described as anything, think that they've been told they have a heart murmur and they're feeling palpitations. So palpitations are the heart rhythm. Murmurs are the flow patterns in the heart that I hear with this. Some are serious, some are not so serious. Some people with funny noises and flow in their heart can also have the electrical system problem of palpitations. If somebody has high blood pressure, are they more likely to have these palpitations than somebody that doesn't, or are they not related? Yes, because high blood pressure is a stress on the system. Basically, it's your, your, your two-inch pump, pumping two inches in and two inches out in the pipe. And then uh, high blood pressure means your outgo pipe is a one-inch pipe. Sooner or later, everybody knows that that pump is not going to be happy and you're going to blow a seal. The way the heart shows that it's blowing a seal is palpitations, racing heartbeats, atrial fibrillation, one of our biggies, and um, chest pains or even heart disease like strokes. So basically, um, high blood pressure makes you much more likely to have palpitations, skips, or extra beats. And they can be a sign of trouble. Now what's important about that is we want to find heart trouble before it becomes serious. So palpitations can be a warning sign. Remember, hypertension's been called the silent killer. So you don't know your blood pressure is 180, but if you're starting to have palpitations and you go to the doctors, we're going to be examining the patient and doing blood pressures. You know, sometimes I say that if you feel this coming on, quick, go take those little tiny aspirin. If you have a palpitation, should you take those little aspirin just as a precaution? I don't think it'll hurt you, and I think if you're having a raising heartbeat with any kind of chest discomfort, I think that's what the Heart Association's talking about. An extra aspirin, if you're not allergic, mm -hmm. I don't believe is a big problem, and I would, might do that. So we certainly think that anybody who's suspicious of their symptom, and like we said, if you think it's serious, and you think you should take an aspirin, you probably should. I've said this on the air, everybody knows that this man is not only my friend, he's also my cardiologist, <laughs> which, which is why I named him Dr. Bart the Heart, my friend. That's right. <laughs> so, but uh, here's something, too, that I, I want to know. What, when I come to you for, let's say, a, a regular exam or something like that, is, and I don't, I'm, a, you know me, I'm like you, I'm outdoors, I'm working, I'm, I'm exercising, I'm cutting trees and things like that, and the heart races here and it slows down there. When you do an exam, do you ever look at something or hear something or notice something that says, you know, you have to be real careful because I'm hearing this or I'm seeing this, and the next time you see this, it might be a heart palpitation, be careful. Will, will you hear or notice that even though I may not? In an exam? Well, yes, and I think when someone comes in for an exam, we do a directed history. <coughs> if you listen to your patients, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. So, and, and patients will oftentimes tell you what's going on, but sometimes you have to sort of drag it out of them. And, but we, we do a history on people. So we're going to ask you, do you have any palpitations? Do you feel your heart skipping? Do you feel heart racings? Do you get dizzy spells with heart racings? Do you wake up in the middle of the night with bad dreams? A lot of bad dreams where you feel like you're racing is actually your heart racing. A lot of panic attacks in the middle of the night are heart rhythms as well. Really? So I'm going to ask you all those questions. You know, by the time patients get to me with a, a complaint of, uh, of um, um, anxiety attacks or panic attacks at night, a lot of those turn out to be heart rhythms. Because if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're just sleeping. Why should you feel your heart pounding suddenly unless you really have had a bad dream? Some of the bad dreams that people have where they say they feel like they're running, they're actually having a fast heartbeat. Because remember, your brain interprets things the way it wants to. So we evaluate those people. Um, so we're going to ask you about your rhythm uh, when we do a history. Then we're going to ask about all those associated symptoms. Is it a chest pain? Is it associated with shortness of breath? Did it make you faint? 
Have you ever had a fainting spell? Uh, very honestly, um, without naming any names, um, it's very common to have someone who has uh, passed out from racing heartbeats. And then we're going to launch into a full evaluation of where these heartbeats came from. We're going to start with the history, find out what caused it, and it might take us to abnormal rhythms. It might take us to a funny sensation in the chest from their esophagus. It might take us to atrial fibrillation, which is a stroke warning, or it might take us to heart attacks uh, uh, or angina leading to a heart attack. So we don't know where it's going to take us, but we want to know the whole history. That's interesting because a lot of times when you and I talk, even on the air, I'll bring up the fact that my mother had this or my father had that. And you say so much of the family history can be associated with this, that if you had a, your dad had a heart attack at 40 and your brother had one at, uh, f you know, 45 and you've just turned uh, 42, chances are there could be a possibility of something in that family history. And you're going to look a little more carefully at that, aren't you? Yes, as we're doing a history, we're always going to want to know the family history, just like we want to know associated diseases. If there's a family history of palpitations, that's important. There are, I have a family with atrial fibrillation in everybody. It's very important. And when the person comes in and says, my palpitation, do you think it could be AFib? Yeah. And is it common? And is it, do we know what gene it is? No, but it's common. And for people who have a long history of high blood pressure, many of them will have high blood pressure in their family, and uh, their, their relative siblings and everybody else will have it. They'll also be more susceptible to having arrhythmias. So again, it depends on where it takes us. How about somebody that's on medication, not related to the heart? Can that give you the heart palpitations as well, some different kinds of medicines? Whether it's something that's prescribed or maybe taking something from the, uh, the health food store, could that sort of make things act up too or interact? Anything that's in your environment or that you take as food, medicine, or whatever can uh, cause palpitations, arrhythmias, and other problems. Just for instance, we know a lot of cold remedies. They tell you don't take if you have heart condition. Don't take if you have high blood pressure. A lot of the Sudafed medicines set off fast heartbeats. There are new drugs like Corsetin and BP that have no heart stimulants in them. Many natural substances like caffeine are stimulants. Red wine has tryptophan in it, sets off a lot of heart arrhythmias. There is a whole series of conditions that are almost like an alcohol allergy where people have too many beers or just one beer and it sets off palpitations, extra heartbeats, atrial fibrillation, or racing heartbeats. So anything you put into your body, whether it be foodstuffs, prescriptions, um, medicines, um, or, or uh, alcohol, can all set off rhythms. How about these energy drinks? Well, we worry about those. They're talking about some very high caffeine levels. You know, we, we, patients are always told, well, don't, um, don't drink a lot of coffee because you might have palpitations. We've got kids drinking Red Bulls, which is what, five cups of coffee? And they have three of them. So um, we're seeing a lot of that, and it's very important. And caffeine is not really poisonous, but anything in excessive dosage is a problem. So well, let's say you've come to the point where, all right, we've discovered that somebody has these kinds of irregular heartbeats, these palpitations. I have to learn to live with it? Is there medicine? Is there surgery? What do I do to treat it? Well, first we want to find out exactly what it is. Just because someone feels a palpitation doesn't mean it is, but it can be. Number two, how serious is it? Is it from the top of the heart and it's a few skips? Or the bottom of the heart, a few skips, like an extra beat? Remember, any part of the heart can beat and interrupt at any time. Most people have those. However, what if they're skipping because there's not enough blood getting down to the bottom of the heart? We've got to find out what your rhythm is. So how do we find out? Well, you come in, we examine you, we, we take your pulse. If I'm feeling somebody having their skips right now, we, and we, you're coming in for an evaluation, we're going to get an EKG. That's a measure of the electrical activity of the heart. It shows the top of the heart, the middle, and the bottom when we look at an EKG. For those, and, people, for those people that may not know, what exactly is an EKG? EKG is a uh, test where we hook up and it measures the electricity of the heart. We hook up a lead to your arms, your legs, and then across your chest. And we're looking at all different parts of the heart to see if the electrical activity is normal. Now, me and Dr. Higgins back there have read 150,000 EKGs, so we sort of know what they look like and what they're supposed to look like. And what we do is we look at the pattern and we see whether the speed's right, the pattern's right, the cadence is right. Does it start at the top and go down to the bottom, or does it start at the bottom and go up to the top? Is it, um, we can tell from an EKG whether an extra beat comes from here, here, or over there. And are, does it mean anything? When we see fast heartbeats, we can say, what kind is it? Where is it coming from? And does this mean there's something underlying the heart? So the EKG is this electrical signal that we measure coming from the heart and tells us what kind of rhythm you have. What kind of rhythm tells us what kind of treatment? What other kind of tests would you do here 
uh, for somebody that might have that kind of um, irregular heartbeat. I mean, you talked about the EKG. Are there other tests that you can do here? So we do this EKG, and we look at it and say, oh, perfectly normal. So we don't say you're crazy and you didn't feel anything. We say we didn't catch it. So then we have different types of monitors. We want to find out what kind of heart rhythm this is. So they've got all, we've got all kinds of fancy types of monitoring that helps us. We don't do it on everybody. We do it when we have a symptom, when we're worried about somebody, or they have symptoms. We can give you a 24-hour EKG uh, that you wear, and it has a, uh, a digital box on it that's reading every, e every EKG that you have in a day, all 180,000 of them. It measures the fast ones, and then it prints them for us, and we can look at them and find out what kind of rhythm you have. What if you only have the rhythm once a week? Well, you put on the monitor, we missed it. So we're going to ask you how often you have it. So we're not going to put, if you have a, a rhythm problem or a palpitation once a month, we're not going to catch it on that one monitor. So we want the best deal for our, for our buck. So we're going to then think about maybe a 48-hour monitor or a 7-day monitor or a 30-day monitor. And, and what kind of monitor de de depends on the patient's symptoms. If we have a patient who's walking along, suddenly goes into a rhythm without any warning and hits the deck, we need a computerized EKG that's going to trigger when there's a rhythm. So these little fancy things from Silicon Valley look at your EKG, sees a dangerous rhythm, and records it. You might be fainting, you might be busy, you might be hurrying to catch a bus, but it catches them. You might be sleeping and not know what's going on. So when you have a triggered monitor, we can find out what's going on even if you didn't complain. It also will have a button on it, a trigger, and you can trigger it saying, I'm having, a heart, I'm having a funny rhythm now, and you press the button. When we look at it, we might find out what kind of rhythm it is. We might find out that you're just feeling normal heartbeats that, that bother you, that, that you feel, because a lot of rhythms that you feel may be normal. And then there's um, some fancy rhythms. What if someone faints twice a year, but faints while they're driving the car? That's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to let them keep driving. Well, at least we try to let them keep driving, but we always we worry about safety. There are even monitors that we, uh, uh, Dr. Wingett, one of our staff members, will put in that monitors your heart for a whole year. They put it under the skin, there's a little wire leading down to the heart, reads the EKG for the entire year, and we can remotely read off of it. And the person comes in and says, you know, I have one of those weak woozy spells a week ago, what do you think? And you read off it and it says, well, there's your rhythm problem, you're too slow, you're too fast. Um, or it came from the bottom of the heart versus the top of the heart, so we can know what we're dealing with. What if they go six months and then faint? They don't have to press a button, we're going to read that. So we have to find out what kind of rhythm someone has before they have troubles. Well, we see these kinds of problems, you know, the baby boomers are moving on in time, we'll see more and more of them. But do, do younger people have these kinds of problems as well, even children? Even newborns, even in utero. We talked about a case the other day, that the, the, they knew the baby's heart was twice normal in the womb and they knew that they were they were trying medications to slow it down before the baby was even born and they end up right after the baby was born putting the baby in hypothermia in a freeze a, a freezing situation and that slowed the heartbeat down when none of the other medicines worked so you can start out with dangerous heartbeats just like adults just like 60 80 90 year olds have as an infant so rhythms can occur at any time if you, we did a study up in Burlington when I was up there. We took um, 100 kids, 10 years old, put monitors on them. They thought that was great. And they were running around hitting each other with sticks and having a great old time. <laughs> and, you know, playing it at, 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 at recess. And 70% of them had a racing heartbeat from the top of the heart at 200 beats a minute. They didn't care. And what really is SVT, or racing heartbeats, superventricular racing heartbeats, are very common in little kids. We're all born with electrical pathways that are extra. We all race. Some of us get it when we're older, like me. Other people, they all disappear as, as you grow up. Your pathway changes. Other people, as we get older, uncover those pathways and start racing again. So, so rhythms can occur at any age. As you get older, though, what we're seeing with baby boomers, what we're seeing with our 90-year-olds, which are our new golfing buddies, um, and, and, and just doing much better than ever before, we're seeing a lot of atrial fibrillation. And that is 30% uh, of all strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. So we get kind of excited about that. So, okay, we've gone through the tests. We've worn the monitor, we bring, bring it back, you read it, you say, yep, you do have an irregular heartbeat. How do you fix it? Well, you also have to find out what it's associated with. Suppose you've got a racing heartbeat from the bottom of the heart, 10 beats racing. <laughs> well, some normal hearts will do that. A lot of athletes, Olympic athletes will do that. 
a lot of people have had heart attacks will do that, and it's very serious. So we want to find out what's in what company does this rhythm keep. So we're going to look at the structure of the heart. So we might do an ultrasound or echo of the heart. Anybody ever have an echo of the heart? They put goop on your chest, they take pictures, the colors are beautiful, and you can see inside. And you're looking for bad valves, you're looking for enlargement, you're looking for a muscle that's too thick, you're looking for uh, an area of heart attack that you didn't see on the EKG, and, th and that will change how you look at the rhythm. A rhythm that you see with a heart attack, like ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, might be uh, very, very serious, and it might be common, in, it might be found in a 40 year old athlete who's running marathons. You approach it differently. So the company that an abnormality keeps is very, very important and then directs us. Um, suppose someone says, well, of course you didn't find that heartbeat on that monitor. It only happens when I'm bicycling at 50 miles, doing 50 mile runs over the Walker Mountain. So then we put them on the treadmill and we might exercise them or a bicycle once in a while and see if we can bring on something. If you have a car that has trouble uh, with its timing when it's at idling, eh, that's pretty important. But if it gets better when it races, you're kind of reassured by it. So you just floor it. But if you have trouble at 50 miles an hour in a car that's supposed to go 70, you've got troubles. So uh, you might have a, a, you know, a, a, a gas f a blockage, an oil blockage, a temperature gauge. You might have an electrical problem. Same thing with the heart. The faster the heart goes, the more work it's doing, the better it should work. So um, the company it keeps is very important. People very commonly have heart attacks. That's a very common disease that we see. And some of them are shown to us or found out because they came in for palpitations. Not usually skips, but certainly racings. And when we put them on the treadmill, we might find out. Oh, wait a minute. You're scaring me on the treadmill. I mean, I'm not that good a shape. I found it out the other day when I was working. The knees aren't what they used to be. So I don't know. How are you going to tre test me if I can't get on the treadmill? We've got a bunch of different types of stress tests that we do here at uh, Rutland. And what we want to do is get people checked out here so that we can determine what's the best therapy. Is it going to be medications that we take care of? Is it going to be uh, pacemakers that we do at the hospital? Or are we going to send someone to a specialized uh, center such as Dartmouth or, or Fletcher Allen. So we have um, about four different types of stress tests. We can do a regular walking test and just measure the electrical activity. It might also show that you got a blocked artery. Might. We can do imaging with either echoes or with nuclear testing and look at the circulation. Is your ability to exercise affected, uh, affecting your arteries? The faster you go, the more blood you need. So if the heart doesn't work well when you're exercising it, we start looking for blockages. And, and we also do stress testing where people can't even get on the treadmill. We'll give them medicine that makes the good arteries look better and the bad arteries look worse. That's called the LEXA scan. And it's, a, and it's a drug that makes the good arteries look better, the bad arteries look worse, and we can find out if someone's got a blockage. Anybody here have a LEXA scan? It's a funny feeling medicine. Last four four minutes and then it's over and then we get pictures that really help us. We don't want to miss a blockage. Um, we do dobutamine stress echoes or dobutamine nucleus where we take the heart and someone who can exercise, mm -hmm. we take Tim, we throw him down on the table, hook up an IV and turn up the medicine called dobutamine. It makes the heart race. It's supposed to make the heart race. It's found in every human being. It's one of the neurotransmitters in the brain so it's natural and we watch it. We have the doctor standing there, me usually, watching the pulse go up and when we hit about 135 or 40 for Tim, and for someone who's 40, about 160, we see how the heart reacts. We see whether the nuclear scan shows normal flow of blood through the heart, or we'll look at an echo and see if the walls look normal, see how the patient reacts. Also, when we give medicine like dobutamine, it's stimulating the heart. We watch for rhythms. Sometimes when we stimulate a rhythm problem during a stress test, we can deal with it right then, but we also know what the person's been having. So whether it's exercise or a, a stress test, we're trying to find out what we're, what we're looking for as a disease and sometimes we have to even cause some problems. Now the other question you should ask is, how safe is that test? Oh, well, that's what I'm worried about, but okay. you tell me. So the risk, anytime you push an engine or take it for a test drive, it certainly is gonna overwork it a little bit. Same thing with these medicines we use. Chance of a heart attack when we're pushing people like this chance of a stroke or something bad is about one in four thousand. However, between me and Dr. Higgins, we've done probably a hundred thousand. Now, let's call it, well, what do you think? Yeah, a lot. 
I don't know how to count, but it's a lot. And basically, uh, what we're trying to do is find out someone's having trouble. So if we find out someone's having trouble, we take care of it right then. We shuffle them off for the next test. We've had a few visits from the ambulance here, but we've done very well with it, and everybody that we've found out that they had troubles turned out doing very well, thank God. Because it's better than having them walk at the mall or hike up a hill or be shoveling dirt in the backyard when they have their heart problem. So we actually try to bring them on. But it's pretty safe, and with the doctors there, and someone's always here, you know, we have a pretty good result. Well, I'm going to ask you about, you know, we talked a little bit about some of these foreign substances you take. You know, if you're taking medicine, or if you're taking something from the health food store, what about, how does that <laughs> affect? <laughs> Which? <laughs> Cigarettes? <laughs> tobacco. We'll oh, okay, tobacco. tobacco. <laughs> Remember, we got to no. specify yeah, these dates. No, no, no. Duh. That one's like this. The other I, one's like this. See, I don't, you'll have to fill me away. But anyway, <laughs> well, smoking strains the heart. It, uh, it upsets the lungs. It can cause emphysema, you know, tar and nicotine. But it also uh, stimulates the heart, and uh, it's not good for the heart. Uh, it cuts down on your oxygen. If you've got heart problems and you smoke, you're going to be let it getting less oxygen. We know long term, over time, cigarettes are bad for the heart. Everybody knows that, right? Even if you smoke, you know it, and it's a battle. It's also very addicting. So smoking is one of our big risk factors. It, um, you know, getting back to palpitations, does it set off uh, cardiac it. rhythms? Yeah, it can, especially low oxygen. Uh, especially nicotine and the uh, uh, the stimulants that are in it, and there's all kinds of stuff in cigarettes now. They try to they put stuff in it to keep it from uh, setting fire to your house. They've got all kinds of chemicals and PCBs, so it can't be good for you. But um, it's one of our biz big risk factors for heart trouble. You know, a lot of times on the show we'll talk about famous people who are in the news that have had heart problems. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was the uh, former vice president that had um, heart palpitations or irregular heartbeats, and he had something put inside of him to regulate them. What, did, what happened? What did they do and what was he wearing? Because a lot of people have them. Are these pacemakers or something more than that? Well, different types of palpitations. Remember, you can have slow, you can have fast heartbeats. They're pretty common, but we also have slow heartbeats. And slow heartbeats, we really don't have any medicines for. So they end up getting pacemakers. Fast heartbeats of a certain type from the bottom of the heart, like uh, Vice President Cheney had, uh, ventricular tachycardia are treated with defibrillators. Now a defibrillator has a bunch of things in it. It can read your EKG. It has a way, it has multiple ways of treating dangerous fast heartbeats, and it has pacemaker, a pacemaker in it. Pacemaker, does everybody know what a pacemaker is? Pacemaker is a box, which we don't have here, but it's about that big and about a half inch thick, that will be there with your pulse in case your heart stops. Or in case we doctors give you a lot of medicine because you're racing. And that combination is not unusual. So we have regular pacemakers and we got these defibrillators. Defibrillators shock you, pacemakers do not. Both go under the skin, both hook with wires down to the heart and they don't hurt very much and they save lives. We're seeing more and more of them every day because of an, an aging population, but we have them in young people too. So a pacemaker, uh, it, he probably had a pacemaker first and then he got the defibrillator because he had those dangerous heartbeats from the bottom of his heart. So I mean, is he gonna sit there, that thing's gonna go off and someone's gonna have to yell clear and he's gonna start that doesn't well, do that, dope, does it? Not like the ones they don't yell clear. Okay. You won't know it's going to happen. Basically, the way a defibrillator works is it sits there and watches the rhythm. If you start racing with a dangerous heartbeat, the defibrillator starts to track it and says, you're going too fast, you're going too fast. And the pacemaker in the defibrillator tries to catch up with your dangerous heartbeat and then overrun it and take over. So basically, it's called overdrive pacing, and it overdrives the dangerous heartbeat. Now, it tries that a couple of different times. Then, if your bottom of your heart is still, you know, thinking, I'm in charge, I'm going to go so fast that I'm going to stop this heart, then it'll shock you. And it's a pretty big shock, because by the time you get there, the way it's manufactured, you want it to work. Because you're sort of at the end of your, you're, you're at the end of the rhythms. And very fast heartbeats can actually stop your heart. From the bottom of the heart, if it's going, you know, 150, 200 beats a minute, it can stop your heart, and permanently. So it shocks you out of it. Now, it is a shock inside your body, but if I'm holding your hand, I won't get shocked. I'm shocked and I, now. And I've stood, next, <laughs> I've stood next to patients who've had this, and it's, it's a very strong shock because we want to convert the heart. Um, somebody would say, well, can't you set it lower? Well, it can be set lower, but you want it to get the job done. Now, that's a defibrillator, remember. Most people that we see with slow heartbeats or even fast and slow heartbeats get pacemakers. 
You know, we had talked about, I know you had them here, these monitors. These are things that people wear, and they give you information. <laughs> Will a pacemaker give you information, too? Yes. The new pacemakers monitor every one of your heartbeats and will tell us whether you've had racing heartbeats from the top of the bottom of the heart. And we have a cadre of pacemaker experts. Raise your hands, please. Raina and Mary Beth. There they are. And, if, and Lorelei knows that stuff, too. But they will, uh, we run the pacemaker clinic here. Actually, they run the pacemaker clinic. We hear about it. They do all the hard work. Basically, you come in, you get your pacemaker checked, and it tells them how long it's going to last on the batteries, which are now up to 11 years, some of them. It tells you how much you're using it in the top part of your heart, the bottom of your heart, and how many extra beats you've had, racing heartbeats you've had, where they came from. And then they come down the hall, and they stand there. And they look at you, <laughs> and they say, what are you going to do about this? About what? And then you look through it, and you decide whether the rhythm is normal for that person, abnormal, should be treated, bring them in, we got to talk about this. So these pacemakers used to be just boxes that fired like that, and they're about this big, about that thick. Now, there are little computers that read your heart rhythm. The defibrillator tells you what it did, how much battery it used, what kind of rhythm it, it, it treated, how it treated it, plus all your other extra beats. Now, if somebody needs a pacemaker, do you do that here? Yes. So that's what, no, that's yeah. the part that I've always wanted to know. How do you change Sign the batteries? Up. <laughs> How do you change the battery? The nice thing is, is, it's like your car. You just change the battery. You don't do everything else. So you, you know, so so someone comes in with a with a pacemaker and gets a new pacemaker nowadays. We're talking eight to twelve years with full usage. Mm -hmm. After that, the battery starts to wind down, and and Raina and Mary Beth are measuring it and saying, "Up, oh, the resistance is going up." Just like when you check a battery, oh, like a half life on that battery. That's fine. Half is good, you know, that's five more years. When it gets down to three months and six months, uh, and some people who are depend on their pacemaker completely, we might do it a little bit earlier. Um, we, we basically decide that the pacemaker's going in, we set you up for a time to visit with Dr. Loris or Dr. Wingett. Dr. Wingett's one, our associate from Burlington, and he'll come down next Wednesday and do some pacemakers. And he also monitors them. And in fact, with remote monitoring, he can watch them up there as well as here. It's magic little boxes that just send messages off. But basically, um, the way a pacemaker goes in and how it works is they, uh, it's a box with one or two wires coming out of it. That's the pacemaker. And the two wires would be simple enough that one wire goes here and one wire goes around it down to here. So it's just like a real pacemaker, uh, just like a real heart pacemaker. Mm -hmm. And they numb up your shoulder. They don't put you to sleep. And they talk to you while they're doing it usually. And they put it in the pocket under your skin and they run the wires down through your veins back to the heart. Because everything, both your arteries and veins lead back to the heart. So they put the wires through your veins until they get one into here and they hook it there. And they're all preformed and you get a little tiny screw on the end, a little tiny screwdriver, a little sterile screwdriver, they screw it in. And then they do the same thing and they lay one down here in your right ventricle, right about down to there. And so, and, and these are built to work together. This one fires and that one fires. If this one fires on your own in your own heart, this one just follows it. If they both work normally, your heartbeat works normally, they don't fire, they watch. So it's, it's, it's miraculous. And that's just the regular pacemaker. We even now have a pacemaker that goes into this, goes down to this area, into this atrium, and then there's two wires that go down to both sides, so they work together. For people with weak hearts, makes them stronger. That's called a bi-V. You got a V here and a V here, that's a bi-V. So that's magical, and that's for very, very special conditions with weak hearts. So not only are you a doc, you have to be a mechanic and an electrician, too. I'm just the spokesman. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wing is doing it, Dr. Loris is doing it, and the technicians who work with them, because this stuff is very technical. These pacemakers have so much information in them, it drives us crazy. Has anybody ever had, watched it? Anybody here have a pacemaker? Do you ever watch all the paper that comes no, out? No, I do. Oh, it's amazing now. It just not only is it stored in the computers, they have all these computers, but paper just runs out. And then they come to you with the paper up to about here and <laughs> hanging out on the floor and say, what do you think? And you're like, oh, show me the problem here. And it is just phenomenal. They, they're watching how fast the electricity goes up. Some of the pacemakers will read whether or not you're fluid overloaded, whether or not you're going into heart failure. And they can tell before you go into heart failure that your volume is too high. So again, you know, Mary Beth Rand come in and say, the Optival says we're retaining fluid. What do you think? You know, and sometimes we'll watch it. Sometimes we'll bring them in. Sometimes we'll change, just change the medicines. So, so these pacemakers are predicting problems in some cases. But they're not perfect. And the change of a battery, very simple. 
unscrew the wire, unscrew the wire, and put them on the backup. They got a backup machine with little alligator clips. Just hook up the little clips to the, and then they look at the battery and they go, yep, get rid of that, and off it goes. And then they take a new one out of the box and take off one wire, take off the other wire, and you're done. The heart can take not beating for one second or two seconds. That's a regular heartbeat. And then they hook it up and screw it in with a little screwdriver, put it back in the same pocket, sew it in with plastic surgery type sutures. You don't even have to have your stitches out. And the biggest complication is always infection, any procedure. And that's always trouble, but very, very, very rare. And if you really need a pacemaker, you, you got to really get it. You know, we've, we've had the discussion with people saying, okay, if I give you the medicine for your fast heartbeat, your heartbeat's going to stop. If your heartbeat stops, that's it. If we leave you in the fast heartbeat, you're going to have a heart attack. What do you want to do? It's like, no choice. This is what you got to do. And it's, for the most part, painless. Um, the doctors are very good at it. And like I said, in 11 years, you come back in and get a new battery. It's amazing. You know, we, we've talked on the program, too, about the advances in medicine. When you started medical school, what was life expectancy? Not yours, I meant for the general public. <laughs> if you're a smoker, about 67, and if you're a non-smoker, about 74. What is life expectancy now? I think we're upwards of about 84 on the average. And um, of course, so many people have stopped smoking, it's really helped. We're down to about 17% smokers. So very honestly, my feeling is as I'm walking around the hallways, if you don't make it to 90, we're not doing our job. There's a sign outside the Leahy Clinic. It's a big um, uh, um, billboard. Were there a lot of billboards you know, in Boston? Right outside the Leahy Clinic, they got a big billboard saying if you could read this sign, you have a 50-50 chance of making it to 100. It's also right next to the Sam Adams Brewery sign. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a partnership. Yeah. So stop and have a brew and have your heart checked. I think they're advertising for, for business, but, but the Lady Clinic's a good place and that's, that's actually where those statistics come in. We've, um, uh, in the cardiology field, we've reduced cardiac deaths of all types. Put them all in a big box and say, these are all the people that uh, the life expectancy or the, their death rate was here. And we've dropped that by 70% over <laughs> 10 years through medications, pacemakers, defibrillators, stopping smoking, better lifestyle. People are exercisers. People are walking. I mean, you really have to watch it when you're driving, and it's good. And, and what we're telling everybody, and I think we mentioned this on the other show, somebody said the other day, you know, what, if you had one thing to tell people to do, or one thing that would be healthy for, for people, uh, what would you suggest? And my feeling is, I don't care what your disease is, I don't care what your condition is, if you exercise <coughs> according to your ability, whether it's chair weights, chair, uh, um, or, or tai chi, or whatever, if you <coughs> exercise, you will help that disease, whatever you've got. I don't care if it's leukemia, cancer, chemotherapy, heart disease. If you can do the exercise that you can do, you will lessen the severity of your disease. So we're kind of pushing that for everybody. See, that's why we talk about hunting on the show from time to time. It's about yes. exercise, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah, hiking in the hills. Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah. It has nothing to do with hunting. And around here, it's nice. It's you, know, you, nice. you know, it's not just the people who are living longer, but you said something, too, that you're seeing people very active into their older years as well. I'm not just talking about you know sitting around and knitting. We're talking about people out playing golf, some of them still jogging. Uh, you mentioned somebody who was in a marathon that was in the 70s or 80s. And, oh, we all easy. And, and, and that was unheard of years ago. <coughs> the advances in medicine now are phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait to see what. You know, when you started, people lived this long. When you, <coughs> at this point, they're living this long. I can't wait for you to retire. I'll live forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep working. <laughs> so, anyway, having talked about all this stuff, and we've kind of been all over the place as usual, but uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Or should, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you do an ablation instead of putting in a defibrillator? You can do ablations. That's my but, best trouble. You but you've understand. got a whole big ventricle here, and those machines <coughs> can come from anywhere. But they do do ablations, and they're very hard. Mm -hmm. And that's somewhere in the future we're going. We do them now. Dr. Wingett will do them. Dr. Wingett's department will do them. And, and th we're talking about for VTAC, which is ventricular tachycardia, fast heartbeat from down here, where defibrillators are put in. And, but the ablations are not perfect. And if you think you got it all, but you didn't, and then they hit the deck, you missed it. So it is useful. It is used. A lot of times, um, uh, we're really looking at the statistics. People will live longer with the defibrillator because the ablation's not perfect. And uh, uh, ablations are still under 
a lot of research. They're not they're not perfect yet. We're still trying to perfect them. We do ablations, or they we have ablations done in the atrium to get rid of AFib, but they've got a 25% chance. You got to go back again and get it ablated, and the the chance of success is not 100%, and that's not too bad. You don't usually die from that, and you can treat it with medicines, and you can go back again. But if you have the one-time dangerous heartbeat down here <coughs> called ventricular tachycardia, it could be one strike and out. So um, I don't think we're um, going to be doing ablations on everybody. And the defibrillators also are coupled with the pacemakers and coupled with the bi-Vs, which make the heart stronger. So it's, um, I'm sure they're working on it. If the, if, if the Dr. Wingett and his associates thought they could get rid of every single extra heartbeat that would kill somebody, they'd do the ablation first. But I don't think we're there yet. I have another weird question. If it's your time to die, and you got a defibrillator, and you got a, a pacemaker, does it make it harder for you to die? Because that keeps, you know, your body wants to die, but that keeps... Well, dying is a complex, multi-system problem. Um, if you have low oxygen because you've got a terrible pneumonia, it doesn't matter how long the pacemaker fires for, you, you've got to have everything working together. Oh, okay. So, in some cases, we will change how a pacemaker is set up and they and I have changed I have turned off defibrillators and people who are terminal so it wouldn't start shocking them as they had a dangerous heartbeat that might stop their life it might be the right decision for them so can it keep you alive yeah that's what it's designed to do will it automatically make you live forever no you've got to have everything working together yes you've talked about low heartbeats um, I can't get it up to 120 when I'm on a treadmill <laughs> Uh, what exactly, at what point should I start to be concerned about this? Well, 120 is not bad for exercise. I mean, uh, time on the treadmill is very important for conditioning. Everybody has a different uh, sort of pulse range, and it has to do with age, too. These young kids, they can start running around the block, and all of a sudden they're going 200, and people like me, well, we're at 130, we're working at max here, and that's great. You don't need to work out at 120 to be conditioning your heart, your body, your muscles, or your lungs. That's so, good for but everything's different. <laughs> um, when you hit 120, are you gasping for breath and collapsing? No, I'm more like 105, 105 or something. When you're working out. But if you hit 120, would you be like flying off the treadmill? Probably. Maxed out? <laughs> so, I, I, if someone can get up to 120, that's really not that bad. And I wouldn't call that a disease. Okay. Um, I think if you were running from a fire, you might hit 140 if you had to. <laughs> getting, getting, it's when you can't get, get the pulse up at all. If someone's sitting at 50, when they come see me, and, and they don't go any faster, and we put them on the treadmill and they stay at 50, that's abnormal. Mm -hmm. That could be an electrical system problem, it could be an artery problem. So what, what the body likes is not this number or that number or more is better. It wants to be in the right range. It's what's, what we call homeostasis. This is where you want to be. You don't want to have the lowest temperature possible. You want to have 98.6. You, know, you know, a fever is bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. But the lower the temperature is not the better you are. When you hit 80, you're not here anymore. <laughs> so you want, the body likes to be where it's supposed to be. So a pulse between 50 and 100 when you're sitting around here, that's not bad. Sometimes with medicine, we put people in the 40s. It's pushing it. People start to feel funny with that. And, and sometimes we have to do that. And if you're constantly racing at 110 just sitting here, that's a problem. You can see that with high thyroid. And eventually, the heart gets really tired or can be damaged by that. And we have something called a tachycardia, fast heartbeat tachycardia, myopathy where the muscle gets weak. So you want to be in the right range. But if you're getting up to 120 once in a while on your treadmill, you're doing great. Not a disease. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, can you explain to us about what happens when you pick up the phone and you do some procedure to get something started again? A friend of mine said, I got to call up. What? What is that? Like you mean on their lady? pacemaker? Yeah. What, you can check pacemakers over the phone. Wow. In the old days, they took the, pace, they took the phone, put a special yeah. magnet on it, put it over their pacemaker, and sent a signal, little beeps, to a clearinghouse. Mm. And we can still do that. Nowadays, a lot of the pacemakers come with this little magic box that you put in the corner of your room. Every time you walk by it, it reads and sends a <laughs> message out. Or we can say, send us a message. Hit the button, and it'll send a message. So that's for checking pacemakers or defibrillators. <coughs> I just saw somebody tell you, I looked at the chart and it said pacemaker check remotely. That means they're sending messages. That's amazing. Well, sometimes you get too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> stacks of them. But, and the Optivals, we'll have people check those at home. Optival is measuring for heart failure at home with some of these really fancy pacemakers. And they'll start, we'll get a reading that says, uh-oh, patient's slipping into trouble. So we don't do that with every pacemaker, but a lot of the new ones are coming with home monitoring. 
and it's kind of like has its own cell phone in it and sends a message to to the the, uh, the monitoring clinic or might send it we have people who sends it that sends to Boston because that's where they got the base maker put in so um, remote monitoring is is really a, a very good idea very helpful yeah what's the effect of chronic uh, sleep deprivation yeah. like uh, four or five nights with no sleep sleep deprivation is a real illness and there are many many causes of it we're seeing a lot of sleep apnea now and I was thinking the other day 15 years ago I didn't even know what it was and now we realize it's a life-threatening disease mm -hmm. sleep deprivation well I uh, was tempted for they found no they found nothing but if you don't get sleep your body doesn't rest and it sets off a lot of arrhythmias from the, the studies they've done on medical students and mm -hmm. young doctors when you stay up for three and four nights you start having palpitations extra beats from anywhere you can go into atrial fibrillation it's not healthy the body needs to rest and sleep apnea is a sleep disorder where you not only are not sleeping, but you're also low oxygen, and that can damage the heart. Well, it's not things. apnea. It's just right. I do not. They, they, I've had four sleep studies. They have ruled out no apnea. But if you're not sleeping, your body's exhausted, your brain's exhausted, and your heart's exhausted. Yeah, I've been up the entire. Yeah. So that's got it. That's another whole specialty and an important issue, and it will cause arrhythmias. And I've had AFib once after being up all night. Though. Sorry. I'm sure it's weak. They say it'll age you 10 years beyond. Yes. Sleep is absolutely part of your health maintenance. Yes. Wolf Parkinson. Wolf Parkinson. Famous doctors I hear. I don't know them personally. I think they're probably all no longer with us. But anyway, it, uh, there's this, we're all born with multiple electrical green pathways. These are the standard ones. Most babies are born with 200 pathways through here, this part of the heart. Some people are, are, and those pathways can allow multiple racing heartbeats to occur. You can go 200 beats a minute. You can go down one, up the other, and then two come down. So you get this circus effect, faster, 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 which you don't want. But Wolf Parkinson White is somewhat, um, is a congenital disorder where your EKG looks funny in a certain way, and you've got another pathway. So here you got this pathway starting here, going through the middle. The middle says you can't go faster than 200. I'm not letting you go 500. If this heart sees 500, it stops. So that's called the governor, like on a bus. You can't go faster than 60. But what happens with Wolf Parkinson White and some other syndromes, there's another pathway that goes around. It goes past the governor, and it can go three or 400 beats a minute or 500. So if the top part goes crazy, like atrial fibrillation, which is 500 or 400, the bottom part can go 400 or 500, and it can stop. And it's oftentimes seen in young people. So Wolf Parkinson White can be a can be a very serious illness, and most of the times they try to burn, freeze, or ablate that pathway, especially in young people. And usually you get a history of fainting, and you know that was a bad rhythm and a warning. So we when we see that, we're looking to see if it's there all the time, see if it's a dangerous type of pathway, and then special testing is done to see if it's dangerous or safe. And many times in young people you would ablate it or freeze it by the special techniques that Dr. Wingett and his friends do up in Burlington. Yeah? Can you talk a bit about the infraction ratio? Um, what is it? How oh, the ejection fraction. Yeah. Uh, when we do echoes, well, when we do um, uh, echoes or nuclear studies, we're evaluating how well the heart squeezes. Remember, we want the heart to be in the right range. We want, don't want it too good and we don't want it too bad. Too weak is bad, too strong is bad. So you want to be somewhere between 50% and 85%. And that's the squeeze of the main pumping chamber here, the left ventricle. So it's called the LVEF, left ventricular ejection fraction. And that tells you how good your heart is. I want to know what mine is, so I did an echo. And you look at the heart and you see it's squeezing a certain amount, you put it in the formula, and it tells you that you're hopefully in the right range. When it drops down to 10 or 20, you're in a lot of trouble. Below 30, there's treatments and we're pretty worried about it. Above 90, the heart's inefficient because it's slamming shut all the time. It doesn't get a chance to fill up. So too strong is a problem, too weak is a problem. Does that work? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes? How long is your ablation last? The procedure? Yeah, I uh, know. <laughs> oh. uh, after you have the procedure, how long should? If they got, well, see, see we're still in the research uh, <clears throat> areas of ablations. I, I, the reason I laughed about that is I was thinking of uh, the record, which is 18 hours of ablation. I know how long they It can take a long time to yes. do because they have to map the whole heart's electrical system. Mm -hmm. But um, 
That's a tough question. You know, it's, I'm kind of out of my field there. I would say that if it's successful, they say if it's if it's successful up to the first three months, that's really good news. If if you have no rhythm problems and they whatever that was that they ablated, whether it be extra beats here or racings from up here or a pathway over here, it's basically freezing a part of the heart to get rid of an electrical pathway. Right. That's really what it is. Right. And, and if and I think if you're good out of a year, you're pretty good. And three years. That's pretty good. Yeah. I would, I would stop worrying about it, but okay. I would also keep my fingers crossed, say my prayers, and hope it doesn't come back, because nothing is guaranteed. Uh, right. But that's very good. Three years is usually very good. Did you have one or two ablations? I had uh, flutter and... Uh, oh, you had one of each? Yeah. Yeah, different rhythms have different types of ablations. Yeah. So, so someone will go in there for atrial fibrillation, take care of the atrial fibrillation, and then they come back in with flutter, and they'll say, Doc, you didn't fix me. No, you have a new problem. Yeah, you need a different type of lation. They got both at the same time. They did. That's yes. fancy. Good. So, uh, Who did you... I shouldn't ask. Yes, question. Yes. Gentleman in the back. Gentleman in the back. Me? Nope, okay. sorry. You're next. Good evening, Doctor. How are you? Yeah, good. Uh, my question, you talk about rest in the hospital, the noise level, the storage of sleep. If you've been there... You don't get any sleep. It can be difficult, <laughs> yes. My question is, have the sleep police been effective in the Rutland Hospital and make it in PC and the other places where you actually can get a rest? I think it's improved some. I think all hospitals suffer from excessive beepers, noises, people talking, tests being done, and your neighbor doesn't feel well. And it's a really hard place to get rest. Uh, very honestly, rest, you want to get at home. When you're sick, you're in the hospital for a certain reason. And we're trying to work on that. We have noise um, monitors that say when it's loud. And, and I think it's better than it was. Uh, having spent the night in the hospital, it's difficult. Uh, and also, a lot of the heart problems that we admit people for, we want blood tests every four hours. That's not a good night's sleep. You know, so, so, yeah. so you're up for an hour while they're doing the test, a half an hour on either side trying to go back to sleep. Then they wake you up and say, time to get up. And you're like, oh. when does that have to I think keep working at it. I think it's a work in progress, and we've got a ways to go. Um, I will, um, this, is, this is the cop-out. All hospitals have trouble with this. So we're part of a big club, and we're working on it, and uh, I think we're better than we were. I, I've, I've been sitting there, and people saying, shh, quiet down. Okay, I'm sorry, you know, because you're waking somebody up. And, you know, in all honesty, someone comes in and has a, a heart problem one night, and they're resting the next night. They got no sleep the first night because they were sick. And the second night, everybody's talking, or we've got a new admission or a serious problem going on. And in the ICU, just the beeping noises from all the different monitors and the respirators drives people crazy. So you can get absolutely um, unnerved, distraught, uh, psychotic in a hospital. It's, it's a very difficult problem. Yes? I just got one of those new event monitors that bounce off the cell towers. Yeah. The auto trigger. Yes. What I wanted to know is are there frequencies that can interfere with that, such as cell phones, Wi Fi, or anything like that? I don't believe so. The experts. Yeah. We're not getting interference, we're not picking up any shows. We're not getting two people coming through the same channel. <laughs> These are important issues. And, and as a non-engineer who had trouble with math, I, I want to know. You know. And hopefully it will auto-trigger appropriately. I think it does. You know what's really important with these things? Diaries. If you say you had chest pain at 4 o'clock, but we see a rhythm at 5 o'clock, that may not be your problem. We may have just found something new. but. You know, so but so. It does it, if it's auto trigger, it does it auto. That's right. That's right. But we want to know how you felt at the time. How people feel is very important. I know we sometimes seem like we're in a rush, but we want to know what your sensation is during a symptom. Mm -hmm. It really changes whether something is serious or not serious. On the on that new cellular monitor. Yes. That she has, it does give the opportunity to, if it auto triggers, it will let you know that it's sending a transmission, and there's a keypad that. Press your symptoms in, and, and some people, if you don't have any, you don't have to press any. However, if you have chest pain, shoulders, breath, lightheadedness, you can select that on your keypad, and then it's transmitted along with that. The symptom itself, yeah. And we also repeat what she said. I didn't hear it on the tape. My on the on the on the event monitor, there is a keypad for typing in your symptoms, so we can associate that with the symptom. Thank you. That's why they're in charge of it. 
<laughs> I just order the test and they, it magically appears. It's wonderful. Yeah. Does it really matter how you get your nightly sleep rest? I'm capable of doing it in installments. I can sleep three hours, be up to, I go back and really sleep three hours. I can do it any time. Everybody's different. Everybody's sleep pattern is different. And everything changes with time. Some people get better as time goes on. Some people get worse. I operated on four hours sleep, said it was wonderful. Uh, but I was 27. <laughs> now it's like eight hours and I'm crawling to the coffee. And that's obviously not a health thing to do, but that's what happens. And so everybody's sleep pattern is different. Yes, in the back there. Can you speak about other arrhythmias, such as benign PPCs, and do they ever go away on their own? Very good point. I spend all this time on the sick people. Everyone, every part of your heart can beat. Everybody's heart has PVCs. Premature ventricular bottom of the heart beats. Everyone has them. If you don't have them, it's a shock. Some people have five a day, some people have five a minute, and some people have 12,000 a day. But if you don't feel them, and they're singles, and you don't have other heart disease, they're not that serious. If they drive you crazy, we got a problem. If you can feel your heart beats, you're kind of cursed. Because if you feel you're out of rhythm, it will create some real psychological problems. And when we treat extra beats, we're using our cardiac medicines or poisons, depending on how you describe them. And they're very hard to treat and make, make them go away. Actually, PVCs are your body's fail-safe system. If you have a virus hit the top pacemaker, then the middle takes over. If the middle gets hit by a virus, the bottom takes over. If you've had a massive heart attack, that PVC may be the only thing that's making your heart beat between life and death. So they serve a purpose, but they can drive you crazy. And most of them are benign, and if they go away with exercise, we tend to think they're not serious. But they're very common. Everyone in this room has them, guaranteed. And the question is, how many? Is that why at night I feel it? I actually take my pulse, and I know my heart. Does it feel like a skip or a pause? It feels like the thumb. It's just, it's something in my chest I can feel. Does I it call it a flutter or a flop, but it isn't really either. Is oh. it a single flop or a multiples? Like bum 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 bum, or is it bum bum? It's usually one, and then it may go. You know, 20 beats and then another one. Sometimes it's only two or three beats in between. It's and when you're quiet, you feel them more at night and they're less serious. When you're out rushing around, shopping, shoveling snow, you don't feel anything, right? No, I don't. So chances are they're benign. And yet coming down here, I'm wearing a heart monitor right now. <laughs> coming down in the car, mm -hmm. it went off automatically and I didn't feel fit. Your, your event monitor went off? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what you've got, but I hope, it, I hope <laughs> it's fine. Got You're still I here, that's a very good sign. It's leaning back here because it wants to be downloaded. See, see, it's a Vermont health check. Here, not here. Above ground, below ground. So, you know, we'll find out how many you have. Some people, like I said, some people have 12,000 of them, some people have two. Some of them are, and, and who knows, it might be from the top of your heart. PVCs can feel just like PACs. It's the timing. But single flops are usually not too serious unless they really drive you crazy or you have heart trouble. And we've got to find out whether you got heart trouble or not. I got checked when I had lots of PVCs. I said, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not supposed to have this. So I ended up with a stress test, an echo, uh, a monitor. I said, 12,000, but no bad forms. Oh, that's not too bad. And so I immediately started the exercise workout program, lost 25 pounds. And so obviously I was nervous, scared like everybody else. So. I think it's the top of my heart, to be honest with you. That's where I Okay. Go. You're, I never argue with the patient, you know why? 90% of the time they're right. When you shoot your mouth open and say, you don't know what you're talking about, we're wrong. Yes, sir? Can PBC cause sharp pain? Some people tell me their heart hurts when they have an extra beat. So, yeah, I, I've heard that. Now, I don't have that, so how, how do I know? So, yeah, we asked earlier, when we were talking about the history, I said, you know, do you get pain with it? Well, they can be pain for five minutes or they can be a single jab. I guess so. Yeah, I think anything. But remember, it could be a pinched nerve, could be an electrical system, could be a, a sudden spasm of your esophagus. There's a lot of stuff in your chest mm -hmm. that makes you think. We'll do a monitor, and every time the person hit the button saying, I'm having a palpitation, there's nothing there. Well, the good news is, it's not your heart, especially if you're a specialist, because it's not my problem anymore. <laughs> but you still feel it, and if it's driving you crazy, you know, pinched nerves, um, stomach. The stomach is a quarter of an inch from your heart. How about people tell me that, how come every time I eat pizza and I get all bloated up, I get extra heartbeats? 
Your stomach's pushing up on the heart. If you poke the heart, you'll get an extra beat. In an operation, when they've got the heart and they poke it with a, with a probe, it'll give you an electrical signal. It's an electrical item, an electrical organ. Yes. Yes. Um, what does the term bigeminy mean? Bigeminy is, this is a very advanced group. <laughs> it is, it has to do with PV, well it can be PVCs or PACs. Premature atrial up here, PVCs, premature ventriculus. It means normal heartbeat followed by an extra beat, followed by a pause usually, and then a normal beat. So what you have is an extra beat. It is usually coupled to the beat before. So the first beat, the normal one, sent a message for the other part of your heart to beat again. So they're coupled together. So every time you have one from the top, you have one from, every time you have a normal heartbeat, because of the electrical hookup, the next one occurs. So people can be in that all day long. So bigeminy used to be thought to be a very dangerous rhythm. I don't think we believe that at all now. It has to do with the company it keeps. If you have bigeminy and then a, a tachycardia from the bottom of the heart, that's serious business. And if the doctor's sitting there looking at more bigeminy, they get kind of nervous because we know something it means that the heart is not normal. Most bigeminy is benign, but it'll drive you crazy because your heart feels like it's totally out of rhythm. It's why I'm waiting, keep waiting for it to beat again. It's slow. And the machines will read it as slower. So you, they'll say your heart beats 40 when it's really 80. Yes? Have you ever heard of anybody having their ears turn beet red like they've been burnt in the sun, sitting completely still? Um, it's happened twice this week. I think so. I think that the I could feel the heat, and I said it, they were so hot. And I looked in the mirror, and it looked like I had been laid out in the sun, and I got... I, I think that's when your skin or anything turns red or someone gets, that's more blood flow going to that part of your body. But it's not necessarily an illness. I mean, people blush, mm -hmm. but pe and people have hot flashes, yeah, men and women, mostly women, and, yeah. and you can feel it in your ears, yes. Yeah. But it's pretty much normal. The, you, your body is always controlling where the blood goes through the capillaries, and it may not always control it the way you sort of want it to, but it may not be serious. Not a sign of illness. Yes? Because something she mentioned, uh -oh. um, I work out 45 minutes a day. Is my event monitor going to lose its mind and go off or explode? Or no, it might show some racings at high rates, um, but it, but no, it's it's designed to deal with that. No, I, I think that won't be a problem. I want you to work out. Like, huh? We want you to work out. We want to see how your heart reacts to being stressed with exercise. That's a good thing. And maybe if you have so much specific. Off, yeah. Mine off. just beeps. Yeah. Oh, and Mary Beth be. might be able to answer that question specifically for you when, when we're done, if that might help. Yeah, Mary Beth's in the back, Beth's she's the, the expert. Back. She's, our, she's one of our experts back there, or Raina. we got a whole bunch of people who might, they could probably answer Woman the in the pink, way in the back. And a quick question. Yes. Has Tikusin been prescribed long enough to be able to just go on with goes way back. Initially, when Ticacin came out, Ticacin is a very strong medicine for atrial fibrillation that we've had some very, very good results with, with appropriate monitoring. It requires extremely close monitoring. You have to be licensed to use it, and it's been around for probably, I think, 25 years. So, you know, when you talk about cancer and new side effects or hurting your liver, you really are pretty good when you get out 25 years. But Ticacin has a lot of dangerous drug reactions, so it's very hard to treat people for all kinds of things because you never, you always have to check every pill they go on because it might interfere. The, the biggest worry with Ticacin is its interference and dangerous effects on the heart when you take a different medicine. We have a certain protocol, as you probably know, we put you through the protocol and if you follow that carefully, you're very safe and it's a very good drug, but if you start giving out other medicines like antibiotics, you get into trouble with, um, with side effects that may set off dangerous heartbeats. So every heart medicine has its good side and its bad side. So is, is there any statistic yet that says if you're on Ticacin for 10 years, it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to work for you anymore? No, I don't think so. I don't think I've heard of any. Um, you, you really don't get used to it, and um, it's been around for quite a while, and it, was, it dropped out of use because of its interaction with other pills. But now that they've got licensed doctors basically giving it, I think we're in good shape. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, I got this forwarded internet uh, message about um, if you feel your um, 
uh, heart out of rhythm to take a deep breath and then a vigorous cough and do that a few times <coughs> it kind of resets your it can be uh, uh, we, we do that with people it the the vagus nerve uh, the, the question is someone was told that if they had funny rhythms that if they took a deep breath and coughed, it might go back to normal or might get rid of them. That's absolutely true. Uh, we also tell people to bear down like they're flexing all their stomach muscles, and that can sometimes break some of the fast racing heartbeats from the top of the heart. They usually don't work from the bottom. It can't hurt you to do it. And coughing is not unusual, and some people cough after they have an extra heartbeat. That really doesn't make it any more serious. So that's, that's a safe internet message. Okay, so we're going to do, yeah. now we're going to do what, oh, boss? So we'd like to thank you. Um, if you have any other d uh, questions, both Dr. Higgins is in the back and Dr. Bonazinga, they'll be here about another f 15 minutes or so. So if you want to ask um, either of them a specific question, you're welcome to. If you have questions about monitors, um, I've got Mary Beth and Raina back there. For anyone who'd like to stay, um, we will do a tour of our testing center. We also have some refreshments downstairs where the testing center is. We have some staff who will be happy to take you along and show you kind of our testing facilities. And we certainly would like you to take advantage of our refreshments because we don't need all of those tomorrow. Um, <laughs> although I, maybe the staff might feel differently about that. Um, and if we could, we'd really ask that you fill out the evaluation, specifically if there's a topic that you'd like to know more about that will help us as we plan more community events as we go forward in the future. Um, if you came in a little bit late and we had run out of the arrhythmia kind of um, one page or the two page um, sheets, we printed some more. Um, so feel free to help help yourself. Uh, Kate's back there and she'll get one for you as well. So we'd like to thank you again. I'd like to thank Dr. Bonazinga and Tim Philbin. I think this was a great interactive conversation. I'd like to thank all of you who, who offered some uh, some great questions. As Dr. Bonazinga said, it was a very uh, well-informed audience. There were lots of questions that were asked that were probably not things we necessarily anticipated hearing. Pretty impressive. But, yeah. but it was great. And we'd like to thank you and our staff is available to help um, show you downstairs if you'd like to see the testing center and even if you don't want to see the testing center we can certainly show you downstairs so you can have some snacks. I'd like to thank you again. Thank you.